Good morning. If you could find your seats, that would be great. What typically happens, well, first, if you haven't been at a TCT early morning, which means 6.30 breakfast, then you haven't had the full taste of the meeting. Um, I will tell you the only thing I won't recommend are the Boston bagels. The Boston bagels are only fair, but the coffee is very good. Um, TCT traditionally does these early morning breakfasts on specific hot new technologies, also late night symposia. And somebody last night said, what's the difference between being a TCT when we started 30 plus years ago and now? And I was reflecting and thinking, and it used to be that we would do these late night meetings, and then I'd go out and do two or three dinners, um, and then I would end up at the bar with Jeff Moses and Paul Tierstein and Antonio Colombo and Eberhard Grube. <laughs> um, and then, of course, we'd stay up very late, and then we would sprint to the morning breakfast the next morning. Well, I can tell you what's different is that we did do an evening symposium last night. It ended a little bit earlier. I did not go out to any dinners. <laughs> I limped my way back to my room, <laughs> got room service, went to sleep. <laughs> the only person at the bar was Eberhard Grube. <laughs> and Jeff Moses. Uh, and I didn't sprint, but I limped to the morning breakfast this morning. So that, for me, is the difference of 30 years of TCT. Um, but I do think that these meetings are really uh, important because some of the uh, specific data on new devices and new products get transferred. You have a chance to ask questions. You have some of the world's experts. And this is a very Canadian-ish morning breakfast. We have Philippe, um, who's kind of transplanted a little bit. Um, and we have Anita, of course, and we have David Wood, and we have a company that's, that's a Canadian company developing uh, a, a new device that we think is very interesting and important. So I'm here really to set the stage, and that's what I'll try to do. So I've been asked to speak about contemporary trends in AS management. This is a fairly obvious discussion, but I'll try to go through at least some of my thoughts. You know, again, I still celebrate Alain Cribier for his courage, his perseverance in doing this first case. I want to again say that this was an extraordinarily complex patient who was near death in cardiogenic shock with prohibitive anatomy that was done with a minimalist approach, no general anesthesia, no transesophageal echo. It was a bicuspid valve using the antegrade access port. It's kind of unfathomable that this was the proof of concept first case. And I spoke to him about 30 minutes after the case, and we had this discussion, and he was a little bit, well, he was overwhelmed emotionally, but also he said, okay, what now? Um, I think at that time, we, no one could have predicted that we would see such a technology evolution. We see so many procedural refinements and simplification. We'd see this avalanche of clinical data, this concept of the heart team becoming accepted, all of which combined to a 30-fold reduction in 30-day mortality. And that, with reduction in complications and the improvement in clinical outcomes, I think that drove the field over the ensuing two decades. So I would argue that the successful evolution of TAVR has been strongly linked to the early identification of evidence gaps and complications with a commitment to rapid iterative improvements in technology and clinical outcomes, to be self-critical, basically, and to continue to evolve. So with all of the good things about TAVR or TAVI, there's still a lot of evidence gaps. We're not going to go through these. Don't get worried. Uh, there are 14 of them on this list, and they're all real. So things are still not perfect, but they've certainly gotten better. I wanted to leave you with the thought also that we focus on the index procedure, and the Savvy Wire is really, it's based on the index procedure, but it's more than that in terms of what it tells you about the patient. So it's good to focus on the index procedure, but I think more going forward, we're gonna be thinking about what happens after the procedure in terms of durability and concomitant disease and adjunctive pharmacotherapy, and I'm particularly interested, as is Philippe, and Nicholas and others in what happens before the index procedure in terms of trying to improve diagnosis, trigger points for therapy, preemptive AVR and whatnot. We'll touch on a few of these. So I want to uh, tell you at least my top five trends. Clearly this patient-specific minimalist procedural technique is real. It's not going to go away. It's only going to refine, improve, and change a little bit. I still think stroke prevention is important. 
And yesterday, if I hear protected TAVA one more time, my head's going to spin. Um, so, the, so the issue of stroke prevention. I think the avoidance and optimal management of conduction abnormalities is still a bit of an issue that we need to continue to work on, and there are a lot of trends. I think the small annulus patient has now become important, partly because, frankly, this is a significant proportion of the women who have aortic stenosis. And we need to be able to optimize treatment to make sure that we have the right technology to suit that anatomic, I won't even call it a variant, I would say it's, it's a normal finding. And if you go to other parts of the world, like India and Asia, it is absolutely a normal finding. And then this concept of the life journey, it's an interesting term, but it means we're treating younger patients, so we have to sustain what we're doing. So first, the minimalist procedural technique. It's all of these things and more. Yes, we try to avoid general anesthesia. Yes, we don't use transesophageal echo. Columbia, we use it selectively. And, and in Morristown, I know it's used selectively. Um, you know, the access is now being modified. We don't use uh, Foley catheters and, or a lot of sedation. We try not to put people in ICUs. We rapidly ambulate and get them home. Pretty much every patient is a candidate for this approach, and it means that the median length of stay should be between one and two days after this procedure. And I always love showing this picture. You see, Philippe is already aged. Um, but, but this is Philippe with the first case that I was aware of, of same-day discharge. For, for TAVR, which I think is pretty cool. It's not something I typically recommend, but I tell you right now that between a quarter and a third of the Cleveland Clinic cases are same-day discharge, and that was actually published. So stroke prevention. I mean, you heard a lot about embolic protection. Uh, this is a terrible complication to have a stroke. It really is, and it's unpredictable, and that's the problem. There's nothing that I can tell you that's going to say that we can selectively use one thing or another that's going to absolutely prevent this. Uh, the, the frequency right now, it's decreased certainly in the low risk patients, and so it's maybe 2%, 2 to 3%, depending upon how you define it. Um, there's no question that we have techniques to be able to capture debris to the extent that that um, absolutely protects the brain from injury is something that continues to be hotly debated. And you heard about protected TAVR. It's the largest TAVR trial that's ever been done before complete TAVR, David. Um, and um, a 3,000 patient trial, uh, we were able to show some things that disabling stroke was reduced, importantly, by almost a full percentage point. But the number needed to treat was 125. The primary endpoint wasn't met. So it'll be interesting to see how people react. Conduction abnormalities, clearly, you know, pacemakers and left bundle branch block are not good things. They predict worse long-term outcomes. We have really good data. Particularly, interestingly, new left bundle branch block is a bad actor. And knowing when to treat and how to follow these patients is something that hasn't been fully resolved. And we've done a lot of work in that specific area. There's a lot of new techniques that I think make a difference and higher placement and cusp overlap and some of the other things that people talk about I think are meaningful and I think it's reduced the need for uh, pacemakers and reduced conduction abnormalities. And, but other decisions about how to diagnose and manage post haver conduction disturbances are still being explored. And I think that there's a lot that will go, um, happen in that area. And there was an interesting study, Optimize Pro with Evolute self-expanding TAVI that I think explored some of this demonstrating that with the best techniques that you could reduce the frequency of these abnormalities. Okay, small annulus and hemodynamics, now we're beginning to warm up to SAVI, I think. So there's a couple of controversies. First, the treatment of a small annulus has tended to preferentially use superannular, although I don't particularly like that term anymore, self-expanding valves due to lower echo-derived gradients and a patient prosthesis mismatch and presumed greater safety, less annular injury. Second controversy is that there is a discordance between echo-derived versus invasive hemodynamics, which is accentuated in small annulus patients, and there's an unclear relationship between the clinical outcomes and post-haver echo hemodynamics. So this has become a heated controversy. You'll hear it explored during some of the subsequent uh, talks. So all the equations that relate invasive and echo gradients were derived in stenotic situations. So there's good concordance. But after you get rid of the stenosis, the obstruction, then it's a little bit of a scatter plot trying to relate the echo and the invasive hemodynamics. 
and there's more of a discordance. There's a very interesting trial, the SMART trial, which is just f finishing enrollment, and we'll get some good evidence about how important are the hemodynamics, how do they relate to clinical outcomes, looking at balloon expandable versus self-expanding devices. And I want to kind of conclude with this concept of the lifelong journey, but focus on something that we've been calling preemptive or earlier TAVR. And it's the point, this is a slide that I, I borrowed, um, stole from Philippe, um, and it really relates to the issue of adverse events are a little bit unpredictable with aortic stenosis. And at what severity of valve disease do you get adverse events? It differs on a patient-by-patient -patient basis. So there's wide patient variability in AS pressure load tolerance and the expression of these adverse events, which gets into the concept that you can't just use this you know, very um, dichotomous classification of aortic stenosis. So the concept of what we've been calling upstream treatment is that this is a chronic disease. It's got a lot of things that punctuate its course. That earlier management, both diagnosis and treatment, is important. Delaying progression is, of course, important. Clinical research should shift from all the late-stage reactive AVR to early-stage preemptive AVR in other complementary therapies. So that's really the concept. And there's a lot of work that's been done with early surgery for asymptomatic severe AS. This is the recovery trial. This is the avatar trial, two small surgical trials, suggesting that earlier treatment makes a difference. But the big study is early TAVR. This is 900 patients carefully done, severe asymptomatic AS, and that's going to make a difference. And then enrollment's complete. We'll have data fairly soon. And another interesting study is the EVOLVE trial, looking at biomarkers to help screen at-risk patients with asymptomatic severe AS. And that'll be done about the same time as early TAVR. And then we conclude with moderate AS. And moderate AS is a bad actor. Uh, and uh, it began with the work that we did with Nick Nicholas, who was really, you know, pretty amazing in terms of developing that clinical trial. Um, and Unload is, conclu is concluding its enrollment by the end of this year, um, and that'll be important for us. Uh, and uh, uh, concurrent with Enroll are two additional studies now in at-risk moderate AS patients. One is the PROGRESS trial, the other is, is um, EXPAND uh, TAVR2. Um, so we'll have a lot of data in uh, preemptive treatment of moderate AS as well. So the savvy wire has specific characteristics that I think factor into many of these evidence gaps and many of these trends, and you'll be hearing about that. And our hope is that we can continue with a variety of new um, uh, uh, technologies uh, and good clinical evidence to refine this procedure. Thank you very much. So Marty, thank you so much. As usual, it was an exceptional uh, overview of the trend in the future. So now it's my pleasure to uh, welcome David Wood. Um, and David will, will tell us why hemodynamic is so important during TAVR. Um, David, all yours. Good morning, guys. Oh my goodness, eh? <laughs> Fabulous. I wish I was out with uh, Nicholas and Emberhart last night, but I was safely tucked in my bed with Marty. Not with Marty, but <laughs> in another bed, in a, another hotel room. And uh, yeah, looking forward to a fabulous, full, exciting day, talking about all the great results here at TCT. Um, I'll show a few slides at the beginning, and then I'll show you um, some fun stuff we've been doing with the Savvy Wire in Vancouver, because I think the value proposition here is huge. So we'll get to that at the end. We've got three cases that I think beautifully highlight how this could be used in the future. Disclosures. I showed this yesterday, and I guess this speaks to the fact that we're very, very interested, obviously, in epicardial coronary artery disease and how we should treat that 4,000 patient study. But embedded within complete TAVR and discordance TAVR is a real focus on invasive hemodynamics, the assessment of hemodynamics, what that means for patients, both short-term and long-term. So at the 120 sites, 106 patients enrolled right now, we are saying that uh, invasive hemodynamics, if you look in that second blue box, is standard of care for all 4,000 patients. I heard a great line yesterday at the Alliance Steering Committee, 
who said it? But anyway, I'm going to take credit for it, that you're taking a fingerprint of the valve at the time of TAVI. Come on, that's pretty good. And so 4,000 patients, invasive hemodynamics, two pigtails. We can talk about what's the best way to do that, but we found that very standardized and reproducible. And then if at any time during the five-year follow-up in the study, the patient has elevated echo gradients or meets VART criteria, we have a hemodynamic core lab for all 4,000 patients. We've asked the investigators to bring the patient back for a repeat uh, assessment on table echo with invasive hemodynamics. I think the wealth of data that we can then feed forward to VARC and other groups looking at that, the heart valve collaboratory, will be invaluable. We also have a large sub-study where the 2,000 patients that are randomized to complete revascularization that come back in a month uh, are having in repeat invasive hemodynamics as well as a repeat on-table echo. So we'll have time point zero, 4,000 patients, invasive hemodynamics, a sub-study of about 200 patients where we'll have it 30 days later, which I think will be fabulous, invasive and uh, echo derived, as well as a right heart cast so we can actually look at all parameters. And then we think, according to Amr, who's much smarter than I am, there could be as many as 250 patients during the five-year follow-ups of the 4,000 patients that would come back for a repeat hemodynamic assessment. So that's complete Tever. And we come up with a fun infographic. I love infographics now. Sandra's going to create a, a forward-facing one saying, don't stent the coronary artery until you come for complete Tever. That's going to be fabulous. We should have a hemodynamic one too with, you know, a little pigtail and maybe Philippe smiling from <laughs> Morristown. Discordance Tever. Another passion project, um, patients anywhere from three months to 10 years post-TAVR who have symptoms, they have multiple comorbidities, you're trying to figure out, is this from the valve not working appropriately? Should we pull the trigger on repeat transcatheter valve and valve procedure? We know, like Goldilocks, we want to find that perfect time to do the second TAVI. We don't want to do it too soon, but we don't want to do it too late. So Discordance Taver, some wonderful co-investigators. We presented the early data at uh, PCR last December, and I think the key word here is then all 13 patients had elevated um, echo-derived gradients. Six had actually VARC-3 hemodynamic valve deterioration, but only two actually required intervention, which I think was very, very interesting. And we came up with this algorithm with Marty and others uh, Phil Pibero, you've got an elevated mean gradient on echo, and again, this is a high-quality echo designed to look at a bioprosthesis. You've repeated it, you meet VARC-3 criteria, you do your cardiac CT, or it could be a TE, you rule out HALT or anything else going on with the leaflets, and then we bring them back for invasive hemodynamics. If there's concordance, in our experience so far in the study, we're enrolling the 50 patients, that's a minority of patients, uh, you would do something, but if there's discordance, we would say there's acceptable valve function. And this is the controversy that Marty alluded to, looking at small annuli and trying to figure out what's, what's best for our patients. And really, that's always been the focus. So let's look at three cases that were done in August um, with the Savuar. And I think this is fascinating. So here you go, patient one, 76, elective TAVI, the mean gradient was 52. There's your area. Um, cash showed two vessel disease, so the patient was enrolled in complete TAVR. On table echo, so done in the exact same hemodynamic state, was nine. On the side there, you can see one of our measurements. So there's a savvy wire down in the LV after we've implanted the valve. We do three samples, one centimeter above the frame, three samples at the arch, and look. And if you look up at the corner here, for standardized invasive hemodynamics, one centimeter above, we just use that one, 5.6, savvy wire was six. Transverse arch, 5.1 and seven. And again, we usually see about a one and a half to two millimeter difference between a centimeter above the valve as to the arch. Uh, and it depends on which THV frame, but it's usually small, but that would be the invasive pressure recovery. So there's case one, because we were very interested in the value proposition of a wire that you could get hemodynamics on, both at the time of TAVI or when you came back and crossed the valve later on to do it. And we want to see in a sub-study just what is the correlation between SAVI and our standardized invasive hemodynamics that we've advocated as standard of care in 4,000 patients. Patient two, again, SAVI wire, 80-year-old, on-table echo six. Um, 
Prior, it was 53. And again, you can see beautiful correlation there between SIH in the middle, 2.4, Savvy Wire 2, transverse arch 3.6 and 2, which I must say is very, very reassuring. And in all three patients, the, the, the wire worked well as far as delivery. We were impressed that uh, we really didn't have any issue with uh, using this wire as a workhorse wire. Uh, here, 76, uh, Echo now 7, and you can see 4.7 and 5, 1 centimeter transverse arch 3.6 and 3. Um, so kind of three interesting cases, kind of to me speaks to the, the value proposition of where this could be going. Um, an algorithm, the savvy wire has the potential to simplify both the acute and long-term hemodynamic assessment of patients. And I guess what I would put out there, let's be a little controversial in the morning, is do we imagine a state where savvy wire, because it also has the AR index, could be used for everything at the time of the procedure. And really, the need to do the on-table echo once this was validated in much larger prospective long studies um, might be even significantly reduced, where you would have the single access, you would put it in, you would pace off it, you would get your hemodynamic fingerprint at the time, and then in the future, if a patient did have symptoms, elevated gradients met VARC-3, or by that time VARC-4, you would uh, bring a patient back um, and simply put a savvy wire across to see kind of what you're doing. And that's obviously forward future thinking, but um, it is intriguing. So thank you so much. Thank you, David. Um, we're going to do questions at the end, so we're just going to continue to just power through. And uh, talking about power through, uh, here's Nicholas Van Meegen, who's going to uh, be able to speak about minimalist TAVR and discuss optimizing outcomes without compromise. Um, I'm not going to ask Nicholas where he was last night at midnight. <laughs> well, he was, he was in bed. I, I confess, I was with Eberhard. I confess, <laughs> but I, I'll deny all the rest. <laughs> it was a long night. But uh, I do have disclosures for this talk, as I always have. Uh, and I think in 2022, this is basically the background. We do have randomized controlled trials to support what, what we are performing in the lab these days. We have randomized studies to back up TAVI in patients at low, intermediate, and high or inoperable uh, operative risk. But in the Netherlands, it's still a, a fact that we are not allowed to treat patients with a low or intermediate risk. There are some ways around it, but that's a, that's a fact in the Netherlands. Uh, and the guidelines in Europe already say, well, if a patient is above 75 years old, there is a class one recommendation to, do, to treat this patient with TAVI. Well, in the Netherlands, we, we managed to get this age threshold at 80 years old. So you see, it's a, it's a different setting in each country. So I think Marty uh, eloquently introduced the concept of upstream TAVI together with uh, Philippe. And I made this little cartoon. So basically, you get born with a healthy valve. And now we only wait for the valve not only to be fully degenerated before we treat it. No, no, the patient also has to be symptomatic before we would treat it. Well, this is where all these new concepts are coming in, complete TAVR, uh, early TAVR, sorry, progress, TAVR unload. You want to prevent the patient from, from getting in that very nasty situation because at that point there is already, already fibrosis and all other stuff happening in the myocardial tissue that will um, impact overall survival of these patients. So we are facing a challenging TAVI program because we're not only treating all the patients with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis. I tell you, within five years, we will treat patients with asymptomatic aortic stenosis. And I do believe that uh, there will be um, a place to treat moderate aortic stenosis. So we're getting there. So that's why we need to streamline and we need to get much better and much more focused during our TAVI procedures, but also during the processes around it. So procedural execution has to be perfect. We want to minimize, obviously, complications. And we also want to mobilize our patients and, and try to strive for an early discharge. So this is the streamlined TAVI program. Also, Marty mentioned it. You want to avoid redundant and excessive needless efforts. So. We, we even abandoned sedation. Our patients are wide awake. We are talking to the patients. They, they really uh, are interacting during a procedure. And the reason why is we really want to assess neuro neurology during the procedure, but also we've seen 
If we look at the, uh, our patients who were treated under general anesthesia and compare them to the patients who were treated with conscious sedation and no, sed no sedation at all, we saw less delirium and less infections in the patients who were treated without any sedation. So there are some subtle nuances in this in the outcome of these patients in their in-hospital stay that make a difference. If you really want to go for an early discharge, especially in these elderly patients, avoid also sedation. This is a typical setting uh, of a um, lean TAVI procedure. So we have a right radial access for filter-based embolic protection. I'm still a believer. I don't care what protected Tower said. Um, there is a 0.8% absolute reduction in disabling stroke in patients with a mean age of 78 years old with an STS score of 3. The higher risk patients were not even involved in this study, and we obviously know that there, were, that there was significant patient selection in that study. There is a single femoral access site, and what do I mean with that? We have a large bore catheter in the common femoral artery, and we have a six French or five French sheath in the superficial femoral artery to accommodate a pigtail catheter. And then we pace on the wire. We have a little needle here piercing through the skin, and we pace on our LV wire. So this is our standard of care, pacing on the wire, cerebral embolic protection, local anesthesia. And this is basically how pacing on the wire looks like. So you have these two crocodiles connected to the skin and also to a wire. This is our default strategy. This is not uh, an exception. So um, this is how it ex is explained. I'm, I'm becoming repetitive, but this is of interest. We published this um, last year in CCI. We looked at all our patients from the, of the last, I think, three or four years, or three years, I think it was, and uh, we had three cohorts. Patients that, uh, where we identified, that we said up front, we're not going to use any pacing. So those were patients uh, receiving self-expanding valves. We avoided pre-dilatation. We expected not to post-dilate those patients. Then we had patients where we said, ah, that's a right bundle branch block and other issues that might put them at risk for a definite pacemaker. So they received an RV pacer. And then, so a temporary pacer. And then the majority of the patients were the patients where we said, listen, we're just going to pace on the LV wire and that's it. So then obviously you want to know were there issues with capturing, with, with the loss of capture, only in 0.5% of the patients? And that was not an issue. We just uh, adjusted the crocodiles. Sometimes we changed the anode and the cathode. That was it. And how many patients then left the cat lab with a temporary pacer in? Only 5%. No drama in the cat lab. If you see that there is a, that there is a high degree AV block, you just leave your delivery catheter in. You keep on pacing on the LV wire. And at the same time, you insert a temporary pacer. That's, what, that's how we do it. No, no, no issues, no casualties during the procedure like that. Then this un unilateral single access strategy. Again, we have those two catheters on one side. And it becomes very easy when you close, when you do your last large bore closure. I think it's mandatory to check that your closure was uh, successful. And you do that by making a final angiogram. Here uh, we are doing our closure with two proglides. This is our, also our standard. And then at the end, we, we try to assess whether there is complete hemostasis. If we don't have complete hemostasis, then we would add another angio seal just to make sure that, um, that we obtained complete hemostasis, patent hemostasis. And then there is this final angiogram. But as long as you have that distal sheet in, it's very easy to make a final angio to make sure that you have uh, success. And I think in terms of access, ultrasound guided access is mandatory. I think we have been uh, emphasizing this for the last decade or so. And uh, the adoption has been, uh, has been growing. I think uh, even David in, uh, in Vancouver, who was first with John, they refused to do ECHO in the 2010, 2011 timeframe. They really uh, embraced it and are now also um, mentoring uh, people to, to do it like this. Here again, we are closing our access. Now we have seen this. So let's go to the invasive hemodynamics. This is very important, and this is still a rate limiting step in our procedure. We insist on doing invasive hemodynamics before and after the valve implantation. But it takes some time because you're gonna, you, you need to have fluid filled catheters, you gotta get rid of the contrast, so for, to have an appropriate measurement, uh, do some zeroing again, it takes time. And, and I like to be fast in the lab, goal oriented, targeted. Um, it takes time and I think this is where the savvy wire comes in and, and I'm very, 
uh, very keen on getting this technology into, into my cat lab just in order to improve uh, further. So this is basically what you're doing. You're waiting in the cat lab, waiting to, for the zeroing of the catheters, and then after the <coughs> procedure, you, you hopefully find that there is no residual or minimal residual gradient after uh, the TAVI uh, procedure. Discharge policy. Uh, we have three discharge pathways. Uh, we have an elective pathway where patients uh, come into the hospital and then either are identified as early for early discharge home, so they would stay within the Erasmus for one or two days and then go home. If we anticipate that they will last longer in the hospital, we send them back to the referring hospital. Uh, sometimes we have patients who were admitted uh, in our, IC in our C ICU or uh, emergency room. Well, they get a fast track and typically they recover at the Erasmus before they go home. And then we have patients who have been admitted in uh, referring hospitals. They are being uh, treated in our center and immediately go back to the referral hospital. By doing so, we have reduced uh, our hospital stay of our patients. ICU care is hardly needed. Less than 10% these days of our patients go to a CCU or an ICU. Typically, we send them back to a holding area for four hours. If they're stable, they go back to the general ward. And then the majority of the patients, uh, they are being discharged within two to five days. Why not all within two days? Because these are octogenarians. In the Netherlands, they really enjoy the nursing the nursing staff, and they, you know, they like to have a couple of days in, the, in our hotel in the hospital. Uh, so we, we won't deny them. So this is why we're not pushing that. But what is important is that there is no penalty for early discharge. So the readmission rate for early discharge is not higher than for the patients who stayed in the hospital for longer. And we have shown that, that the major issues for, um, uh, a, sim for a readmission is an infection. And that is also a reason why we further want to streamline uh, our procedures. So that is why percutaneous access, no ICU, perfect access management, stimulate ambulation, but also reduce instrumentation and no pacemakers. So typically I would say streamline TAVI works. It's cost effective. You need to be mindful of your resources. You involve the referring hospitals and early discharge in my practice is feasible in selected patients. These days it's 30% of the patients. Within 48 hours we, want, we are aiming for 50% and you want to optimize your selection strategies but also optimize your streamlining and I think that is where uh, a savvy wire technology comes into play. Thank you for your attention. Okay, our co-moderator, Philippe Genero, you've been hearing little bits and pieces about the savvy wire. Now we're going to get a bit of a deep dive with a device review and some case examples. Uh, thanks, Marty. So uh, I want to thank Absent for putting this uh, together with uh, a group of friends and colleagues that uh, we've been pushing this field for the last 15 years uh, and based uh, um, on our, our mentor and legend, Marty Leon. So it's very an honor to present this, what I believe is truly disruptive technology and we help optimize um, um, the, uh, our outcome uh, for our patients. So it's very uh, happy to present the Opsen Savvy Wire. We're gonna have some case review, uh, many case from the, the um, first in human study from um, Joseph Rodez Cabo and Red Ibrahim. So, uh, here's my disclosure. So this is what we're going to talk about, the absence savvy wire for TAVI. Um, this is a, a workhorse TAVI uh, wire, um, which capacity for pacing and capacity to uh, continuous monitoring with the gradient and the pressure and other uh, feature such as a rapid pacing. So this is uh, the beast. Um, this is a structural pre-shaped guide wire, 035, uh, exchange length 280. Uh, Pre-shaped, two, two sizes will be available, small and extra small, as we know. And it has a very nice PTFE orange uh, coating, so you can see it on the table very nicely. Um, and, and there's the property technology of, um, of OpSense, the optical pressure uh, sensor, which, by the way, is the same sensor that they use on the FFR, uh, their um, uh, DPR wire, and also the same sensor that is in the Abiumed uh, um, console. Um, and there's an opti optical connector. In terms of behavior of the wire, it's, it's in between a Safari and Confida, but I will say it's really a third generation dedicated TAVI wire. So based on all the learning that we had uh, from, from using guide wire, I will say it's, uh, people were very impressed uh, with the behavior of this wire. Uh, this is what it looked like. So it's give you live hemodynamic 
um, without catheter exchange. Nicola Van Megan talked about the efficiency of the cases. I like to be efficient too. Uh, no exchanges. And one thing that I really don't like about uh, regular cases, the, all the exchange and the cross of the aorta, you know, pigtail crossing the arch, which could be uh, detrimental for a patient. So you, this is a, an example of the first in human. You have live gradient with very nice index that will be integrated in, in, in the software, such as the regurgitation aortic index and some assessment of the aortic regurgitation, which, which I think will be a very nice feature. This is a picture of the first in human that was completed in Canada, both by Dr. Jose Perdescabo and Red Ibrahim team in Montreal Heart Institute. Uh, 20 patients. I'm going to go quickly on the result. Um, mainly uh, all comers, Taver in, in, in Canada. And, and the primary endpoint was um, the safety, the absence of any major complication related to the guide wire. Uh, and the efficacy was rapid pacing without any um, loss of capture and gradient. So this is uh, some example, regular TAVR. Um, ventricular positioning was easy and, and the lead delivering uh, was uh, similar to all the other wire with very good support um, and, and allowed a, a, a standard uh, TAVR, no, no, no rocket science here, uh, and allowed very nice delivery of the valve with no issue. Um, Importantly, like Nicola uh, says, I, li I like to do inupolar uh, pacing of the wires to avoid venous access. So all the pacing were done on the wire, uh, and this is what you can see with, um, with the great hemodynamic. And the key with the LV pacing is really give you a nice, sharp drop of blood pressure. When you have RV pacing, you have a delay on the translation of drop of pressure, which can be very detrimental. I think this is one of the, uh, I would say, uh, benefit of LF ventricular pa pressure is more efficient. Uh, and this is the hemodynamic pressure. You can see the display. Um, and that could be transported actually to your report uh, and, and, and really in a nice display uh, before and after uh, the case. So this is the result that were published in early intervention. You can see uh, no major issue with mortality, stroke, or, or vascular complication. If related to the side wire, the rapid pacing capture failure was zero. So all the, the, the procedures were successful, and no successful, uh, successful by implantation in all the patients. So no major e issue with the wire, the positioning, which is obviously very important um, for a first in human study. And, and importantly, it was done equally with Medtronic, self-expandable, and or balloon expandable with Edwards, who work well with both um, platform. So complementary to this, so obviously, unfortunately, in US, we didn't have the chance to do this. So we did a complementary study at Morristown. What we did is we used 20 patients, and we used the OptiWire, the, the, the wire, the 014 wire, which actually has the same sensor, and we had lucky enough to have the same software algorithm. So what we did is we compared the OptiWire um, with two pigtail measurements, but also with TTE before, TEE before, and two pigtail and absence wire. Nobody would do that again, I can tell you. And we did it before and after. So what we saw, and we were just published in JSKY, uh, is it was a very good correlation with the absence wire, such as the case David show, per, almost perfect correlation with the absence and the two pigtail technique, um, and, and, and both before and after. Uh, and, and we saw some discrepancy actually compared to the echo, which was uh, common um, and, and, and seen in the literature prior. So this is a summary of the study, as you can see, before the case, which is important because we use a 014 wire to cross the valve. And keep that in mind to use this 014 wire, FFR wire, could be very useful in evaluation before and after, where you, maybe you don't want to cross the valve with 035. So we, we saw a very good pre, um, um, no difference, actually, absolute mean difference of 2.2 gradient between two pigtail and the absence uh, wire before and after only one difference. So very s similar result as two pigtail uh, using the sensor of, uh, of uh, absence um, for evaluation of AS before or after. So I think in conclusion, savvy wire has three function. Valve implantation is a dedicated wire that could be used as a workhorse. Second, pressure uh, could be uh, very useful for optimizing the outcome uh, after uh, and also with evaluation of AI. And, and third, pacing. So um, I like to use a 3P for, for this, positioning, pressure, pacing. Um, and, and I think it's, it's, it really will uh, optimize the procedure. Where I see the benefit in the future, so I think it could be the de dedicated LV pacing wire for, for, the, for, for, uh, for TAVI. For There's no doubt in my mind is we optimize the minimistic approach. Um, valve and valve, I think it's a no-brainer for me. 
valve and valve, should we crack, should we stop, uh, what is the, um, uh, the result after, I think that will be very important. Complex anatomy, uh, such as bicuspid, should we stop again, we'll post-dilate. Balloon valvoplasty, and we didn't talk about that, but there's a lot of exchange. We, uh, we still do a lot of those in very complex, uh, risk, uh, risky patient. And AR uh, assessment. The other one I didn't put there is uh, we are entering an era, I believe, of leaflet modification. Uh, there's a lot of devices out there that are coming. Picardia is one of them with the leaflets or the shortcut, and we need to monitor the progress we do with leaflet modification um, before TAVR implantation. So good news for Opsense, they get the FDA clearance in September 14th for the use of the water in the U.S., and we're very excited to, to do um, a couple of cases um, and then next week as soon as TCT is done. So uh, we'll give you our feedback. We're very excited and congratulations to all the team. So I'm going to go with a few cases that were courtesy of Dr. Rida Ibrahim that was done at, um, at Montreal Heart Institute. This is a very complex case of axillary, and you can see the absence water was supportive enough for these torturous cases um, and, and ensure the deliverability of the device of the sheet uh, and allow a successful TAVR. So I think this case illustrates the behavior of the water that could be used in any type of anatomy and, and end up with a very successful uh, valve implantation with no issue. And you can see with the pre and post gradient, uh, very, uh, very nice display uh, of the pressure. So in conclusion, I think the SAVI wire uh, obviously is the first dedicated TAVI pressure wire with pacing capability, which I think will really improve and streamline uh, the care of, the, of our patient. Um, the study demonstrates appropriate left LV pacing. I think in the next five, 10 years, we're gonna see a lot of study ongoing, trying to show that LV pacing might be safer and better for a patient. And I think the SAVI wire will be a useful tool for that. I believe the, the hemodynamic uh, post, pre and post is all crucial if we want to go in low risk patient and ensure um, valve uh, optimization. Uh, and, and at the end of the day, I think the savvy wire will make our life easier. The ease of use will always win. And I think uh, savvy wire is the perfect tool to simplify our TABI procedure. So once again, thank you for putting this breakfast together. And it's, uh, it's a really, uh, really excited to use this device. Thank you so much. Philip, thanks a lot. I'll, I'll introduce our last speaker and then I'll let you handle the panel. Um, it's Anita Asgar, and uh, she's been busy the last couple of days. <laughs> she has the Montreal Heart live cases tomorrow at TCT, so a lot on her plate. But she's going to share some of her vision of additional applications of this technology. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with everyone this morning. I appreciate the invitation. And I'm going to talk to you about something a little bit different. You know, other potential applications for the savvy wire and some of the other structural interventions that we do. So I don't have any disclosures for this presentation. So, you know, we've talked a lot about hemodynamics in, in TAVR and aortic interventions, but, you know, the other question is what is the value of hemodynamic assessment during any other structural intervention? What are some of the challenges that remain for us? And how could a dedicated wire with a hemodynamic assessment actually be beneficial? So this was a really nice paper that came out last year um, by the group from the Mayo Clinic and really describing what the role of invasive hemodynamics is in guiding contemporary transcatheter valvular interventions. And there's no question that ECHO is phenomenal, it helps guide our procedures, but invasive hemodynamic assessment, at least for a structural interventionist, is, a, is an important critical skill for us when we're performing these procedures, but it also helps us in, in more complicated situations. And having the support of tools that can help us evaluate during real-time procedures adds a wealth of knowledge for us as we're trying to decide what's the next step. So I'm going to show you a couple of potential applications. So I'm going to start with transcatheter mitral valve replacement. And as we know, the first mitral valve intervention you're going to have is often not the last. And if we look back at the couple of you know, years prior, in 2017, the FDA approved mitral valve and valve for dysfunctional bioprosthetic valves. And in 2021, it approved a mitral valve and ring. And these have been game-changing procedures for patients who don't have any other in, you know, options for, in terms of treatment. But there are procedural challenges associated with these, in particular left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, which we know can be potentially fatal, and you know, although there are ways to manage it, are quite challenging. And then we do see residual valve gradients post-TMBR, particularly in mitral valve and valve. 
So if we think about left ventricular obstruction, you know, this is not a new entity. We've talked about it more with transcatheter mitral valve replacement. It was actually first described in 1977 in post-op patients following um, mitral valve repair. And we've known now with a lot of some of the excellent work done by our imaging colleagues that several risk factors have been identified and you can assess these on CT scan pre-procedure. But despite that, periprocedure monitoring of the hemodynamics is essential. And we can all try to predict as best we can with the neo-LVOT, but, you know, LVOT obstruction still occurs despite our best uh, predictive efforts. And if it does happen, the mortality can be high, even though we have procedures like septal ablation or sesame to, to try to treat this. In terms of procedural planning for TMVR, as you're aware, you know, it's a complex procedure. There's a lot of initial CT evaluation. There's some quite complex advanced CT modeling that you can do. But it, despite all that, we still need to do hemodynamic monitoring of the LVOT gradient during the procedure. And this, I think, is one of the key places where a savvy wire could be helpful to us. You know, you place this inside the ventricle, you can even pace on it. I'm going to show you just uh, some potential options. If you're doing transeptal TMVR, you can use this wire to deliver your valve as well. But this is a way to do some constant hemodynamic monitoring during your TMVR, pacing if you need it, but real-time assessment of that LVOT gradient, you know, you'll be able to recognize it quite quickly, and you're able to manage it, uh, you know, equally as quickly. So in terms of trying to draw in where the, where the savvy wire would go, but const, you, know, you get this constant monitoring of LVOT gradients during TMVR procedures, which I think can be you know, game changing for these patients, particularly if this occurs to pick it up early and then you know, manage it appropriately. The other thing I thought would be interesting is you know, now the transeptal um, TMVR is coming. We've got new devices that are going transeptal. You know, and this could be the wire that we use to do our TMVR procedures. And this is, again, an excellent paper that was published a couple of years ago um, from the group in France looking at a stepwise approach to transeptal TMVR. You know, when I look at this, what I think about this wire is, you know, we can place this wire transeptally as well. We can deliver our TMVR device on this wire, and we can perform perform rapid pacing, and we're also going to get a hemodynamic assessment of LVOT obstruction pre, during, and post TMVR, as well as assessment of mitral valve gradients. If we use our sheath in the left atrium, we can calculate our mitral valve gradients invasively as well. So this, I think, is a very exciting application of this device. I'll just finish talking with, about transcatheter tricuspid interventions. This is another exciting area. You know, these, <clears throat> excuse me, interventions have exploded in the past couple of years looking at tear, but also transcatheter tricuspid valve replacement. And, you know, we also have these procedures of valve and valve, valve and ring. And the current changes, you know, the current challenges, you know, include the requirement of a new pacemaker following intervention. And so having pacing on this wire, being able to evaluate gradients on the right side um, at the same time, you know, are crucial in these types of procedures. And so <clears throat> this is the publication from, um, from Sushil Kodali and the, using the Evoke device. And we've seen now that we can do transfemoral, transcatheter uh, tricuspid valve replacement. It's safe. It's feasible. There's new pacemaker, however, requirements in these patients, and you have some block during the procedure. And so hemodynamic monitoring, I think, with the ability to easily pace will be a benefit in these procedures as well, uh, as well as the valve and valve procedures. So just to conclude, uh, understanding of hemodynamics is critical for valvular pre procedures other than TAVR as well. LVOT obstruction, particularly with TMVR, if it occurs, may be fatal. And the ability to have reliable, simple hemodynamic monitoring during TMVR, mitral valve and valve, and valve and ring will be essential to evaluate procedural LVOT obstruction. As well, hemodynamic monitoring during tricuspid valve procedures with the ability to perform pacing, I think will have added value for these procedures. Thank you. So, Anita, was a beautiful um, overview of where we can take the savvy wires. So, we're going to open the panel for, for discussion. And I want to first uh, ask Thomas uh, Wagner. Um, I don't know you a lot, but you've seen a like, guy who like to be efficient, um, um, lean and mean. Um, tell me, where do you see uh, in your practice um, the place of savvy wire and, and I, uh, how you can and see improving your efficiency? Yeah, it's an exciting time to be in a structuralist still. You know, we thought Tavar had plateaued, and now is a new sexy tool that we can pull out our toolbox and use. So, 
We do about 10 to 11 towers every Tuesday, and I can tell you being efficient is very, very important. <laughs> so a wire like this will be, I think, something that will be a game changer for our practice. As we start doing more and more towers, we're trying to push for 12 on Tuesdays. Um, I think this wire is, uh, is helpful and an additive in many ways outside of just TAVAR. If you think about how we approach aortic valve interventions um, in the future, we may be doing you know, different tools or different devices like lithotripsy and managing you know, cases, delaying valve interventions and assessing hemodynamics is gonna become even more important in the lifetime management discussions in lower cohorts. So I think the wire has a, has a very unique role in assessing those gradients. Yeah, what Tom didn't tell you is that he does 12 left atrial appendage occlusions on Monday and six mitre clips on Wednesday. And it's, so, yeah, he's, he's a very busy guy. <laughs> so, um, you know, the FDA birdie whispered in my ear and said that they're going to be approving a lot of new devices before TCT. So, so we had a little bit of wind that we have some some um, uh, uh, excitement with savvy. So having this approved really does make a difference. Um, I just wanted to alert people. I, I just want to make two comments. One is that we are planning and are deep into the planning stage of a, of a truly pragmatic, large clinical trial, 4,000 patients comparing LV versus RV pacing. Um, and um, it's going to be very, very interesting. Um, because I do think that there are some real efficiencies that result in, you know, not just making the procedure simpler and faster, but also that may affect clinical outcomes in doing that. And it would be great if we can get the savvy wire involved in that trial. So, Lewis, I'm going to be meeting with you shortly uh, now that it's approved by the FDA. Second thing, and, and, th and this is a question, you know, I come from a coronary lineage, and, and what my colleagues and friends who are high volume operators, the one thing that they will always say is, don't mess with my wire. I mean, my wire is my life. This is what I really enjoy. Uh, and to say that there's now going to be a new wire that's a one wire that everybody's going to use for every case, that's a little bit tricky, I think. Because right now, if you, if you go from balloon expandable to self-expanding, you, you might not use the same wire. So to think that one wire is going to be able to do everything, I'm still not certain that we're going to be able to get there, but I'd like other people's opinion about that. So even though this may be a good wire, it really hasn't been tested generally, and it may not fulfill all the requirements for all of the different uh, TAVI devices that are being used. Marty, can we use it for Watchmen? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm sure you can <laughs> to take the pressure. So I, I will uh, push back a little bit uh, on Marty's comment, maybe for the first time in my life, but let's try that. So um, I think for me, the way I see this is uh, the delivery system of the tavern, especially with balloon expendable, becomes so easy. Um, I, I'm not sure uh, that you know uh, the wire in terms of behavior will make a big difference for probably 90% of the case. If you do self-expendable valve, I agree that there's a 34, is annoying, is jumping, moving, tortures, they could be an issue. But for most of the case, uh, I, you know, it's, it's not a problem. So I think for most of the case, you can use any wire, but I think the benefit of pacing and pressure will, 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 will probably win. Um, I think there's two, two sides, small, extra small. Um, I, will, I, I cannot wait to use this wire on Thursday. Um, to, to have the feel. Um, I believe when I handle this, it's stiffer and it will be uh, almost between uh, Lundquist and, 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 and Confida. So we'll see the behavior, but I have to say the 90% of the patient, you can do this with, 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 with a regular J if you want. Um, but um, I don't know what other things, Nicholas, you have a lot of experience. Yeah, well, I'm, um, I hear a lot about using Lundquist wires for self expanding valve deployment. We never do it. Uh, it's, it's rare that I would use a wire that is stiffer than a safari wire. The predominant reason basically is that if there is excessive tortuosity in the iliacs, in the iliacs and in the aorta, um, that's where a very stiff wire might come to, you, to your rescue. Otherwise, I'm not so convinced. So I, if, if I believe that we can end up working with one uh, workhorse wire, and then I would choose a stiffness a little bit stiffer than a, than a current Safari or Confida wire, uh, but I don't think it needs to be as stiff as a, as a Lundquist, but it's an it's a experience. So I think it's an incredibly important point from Marty and completely agree. So we're in socialized medicine in Canada and we like our $60 Amplex extra stiff wire. 
we can do, you know, all your cases. Dave, we get it for twenty four ninety five. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so, but I think it's an important point, and that's why we've been dragging out the engineers to Vancouver to play with it, because that was the concern. So thank you. And the feedback was, look, you know, we've only done seven or eight cases so far. Um, yeah, so far in regular anatomy, it has not been an issue. The idea that maybe in the future we would have a version that was a little bit stiffer, I know we've chatted about in the past. I guess we'll have to see where it lands. Um, so whether you'd have a couple of different versions of Savvy, um, a stiffer version. But I must say this version that we've been playing with so far, N of 8, has been pretty easy and we haven't had any issues. So thanks. So maybe one, one question for Anita um, and maybe Nicholas, you can chime in because you're the expert. So pacing on the water. In Europe, it's been embraced broadly. Uh, in US, it seems that it's dragging. I don't know because maybe we didn't have a, a dedicated wire. We don't like customized wire. What, what are you doing, Anita, in your center? And Nicholas, what is your thought about uniport or biport? Or is it a little bit of BS? What, what do you think? So, so we're using exclusively LV pacing. And you know, we've We've all seen it. You know, we have these temporary pacemakers in the RV that not un infrequently cause complications, where we take out the wire, we get back, and you have a pericardial fusion, sometimes even tamponade. And so, you know, since we've started um, LV pacing, first of all, it's much, much faster. We don't need another venous access. And, um, you know, for the most part, we've had very, very little in the way of complications. And so for us, it's just, it's a, we can't do 11 tavers in a day, but, you know, something to aspire to definitely <laughs> and I think you have other day in the week in Montreal right <laughs> <laughs> we wouldn't be able we wouldn't be able to to put these patients in our hospital 12 beds I don't have 12 beds <laughs> but uh, at the same time um, yeah it's I think we have a similar practice as in as in Montreal heart uh, it, it's really it's streamlined and it's very reproducible and uh, I don't know where the anxiety comes from in in the US it, maybe it's a little bit of an inertia still uh, but um, it, re it, is, it is real, it is a safe way of, uh, of moving forward in your procedures and I know that some sites still insert a venous uh, sheath uh, just in case, we don't even do that. Yeah, I think there is, I mean right now the application of LV pacing for TAVR in the U.S. is about 10% wow. and it's been flat, mm. okay? Um, and part of it is the perception of loss of capture. Uh, second is the modifications on the wires you've got to do in order to try to improve capture in terms of scraping and this and that. You never so, scrape. That's, well, I'm that's just all, telling you what people are, you know, you know, s some of the hesitations. Yeah. Third is that with self-expanding valves, there's a lot of interaction with the wire in terms of positioning and people are nervous about moving the wire, you know, you know moving your pacing wire. Um, so that's another. So, so I'm just you know, pointing out at least some of the reasons. A lot of it is simply lack of training, mm -hmm. lack of proper training. So what we'll try to do in this pragmatic pace study is to get people properly trained and to be able to use devices that, you know, they're comfortable with and to, and to measure all these things. So, it, it, you know, it will be a randomized trial. So, so I think it'll be interesting. If that trial's successful, then that number of 10% will go to 90%. Mm -hmm. All right, so it's uh, already 7.30, so by respect of time and schedule, I want to close this session. I want to thank Opsense for the sponsors sponsorship of this event and the, the panel and, and the attendee for being uh, so uh, bright and early. So thank you, uh, everyone.